Um, you know, for me, as someone who is trained at a liberal arts institution, that's always been a really important thing. Um, and the truth is, even as a, a young biologist, I was sort of torn my freshman year and decided between art and science. Um, and I would like to think, you know, I've reached a point where I haven't had to make that decision at all. Uh, but one of, the, one of the interesting things that I, I see sort of looking back at doing science and looking back at doing art is the fact that they share something pretty fundamental. Um, and I use um, the example of the scientific method, which is a, you know, a basic four-step process of observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and conclusion. And I really compare that to the four-panel comic strip, which most people are familiar with, in which you have sort of a setup, a hook, you know, a line that sort of prepares you for the punchline, and then boom, the punchline. Both use sort of a four-step progression. Um, and most cartoonists who do those strips use four, and most scientists use that, that particular method. The question becomes what really distinguishes, um, you know, an Einstein and a Darwin from me, right? Or, you know, a Charles Schultz and uh, from, well, I guess me. <laughs> and, um, and the answer is creativity. I think both of these disciplines utilize creativity. I mean, you can, you can read, you know, in the New York Times, Science Times about um, some phenomenally elegant piece of research and you can intuitively say, wow, that was, that was really amazing, it's really creative. Um, and so I think that, that what I've discovered is that the thing that sort of links those two sides is, is this you know, ability to cross connect and, be, and try to be a creative at least. And comic books apparently have been something that have fascinated you since childhood. Is, is it the combination of words and pictures and, and why is it that these are, are good vehicles for conveying what can be very complex information? Well, I think that um, one of the things that um, uh, has sort of trickled into you know, the snide vernacular of our, of our culture is, you know, books with pictures, right? Uh, if, you, if you tell a somebody, yeah, if you tell somebody <laughs> I read books with pictures, that's usually a dig. Um, but the, the thing that I've also discovered in my you know, few years as a, as a biology faculty is that when I select a textbook for my course, one of the first things I look at is the pictures. Um, and it's, it's, it's an old saw that pictures are worth a thousand words, but they really are. There's a reason why um, when you are on a plane and they provide you instructions, right, for what happens if the plane starts to plummet into the ocean, that it isn't a block of text. It's right? illustrated. It's an illustrated thing. It, uh, illustrations are sort of mainline ways to get information into a brain. And, oh, go ahead. You, well, you have said that, that you're pa when you're passionate about something, especially in science, you want to make an original contribution, and you certainly have uh, with, with your comic book series. Your most recent one is The Sandbook Adventures, which explores the evolution creation debate, and, and it's really marvelous. The story is told through the mind of Mara, who is a follicle mite um, living in Charles Darwin's eyebrow. Tell us a little bit about that, that storytelling device. Yeah, you know, I'm, I had, I'd wanted to do a story about Charles Darwin for a long time. He was sort of a scientific um, hero of mine. And, um, but I was looking for a vehicle that would be interesting and new. Uh, there are plenty of biographies out there by, you know, people a lot smarter than me. And I was looking for a device that would allow me not only to tell a little bit about his, his life, but also about his theory. And um, I was actually reading a National Geographic um, article called Body Beast that talked about follicle mites. And for whatever reason, the right synapses fired in my brain. And I got, got it into my head that we'd have a mite that for some unexplained reason could, could be heard by Darwin and who could talk to Darwin. Uh, and then I, would, I had this vehicle for creating a mythology. Uh, part of the book is about the mythology of his life and how he dispels some of that mythology and also dispels the misconceptions that he is their creator. Um, and in the process of doing that, he actually has to map out his theory. And the, the tor story is told late in his life, and so you also get to see in the very last chapter the part of his theory that he hadn't worked out just quite yet. And, um, but, and it had to do with um, inheritance. Uh, and you get a feel intuitively, we know now what inheritance is about. It's about genes and, and, and whatnot. And so it, the book sort of leaves Darwin at a point where, you know, to him, it's still not completely explained, but we sort of have a better, a better insight. Now, in one frame from this, you show the classic progression of man from a legless life form to an erect man. Darwin is saying that evolution is not a nice, neat, progressive march. Tell us something about this strip. 
Do, would you like me to read it? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, Darwin has just slipped uh, on, the, on his sandwalk and he's talking to Mary and he says, the point is that you're thinking about this all wrong. Evolution is not a nice, neat, progressive march. There's no predictable destination. It's a process of surviving unpredictable events and often unpredictable ways. It's very easy for us. Um, uh, Richard Dawkins has a new book called The Ancestor's Tale that, talks, that starts with a chapter called The Conceit of Hindsight. And we often as humans believe that um, even when, when you find people who accept the fact that evolution happened, um, believe that it happened to get to us as if it was a big recipe and bing, you know, we're done baking and here are humans. And in fact, we are, as Stephen Jay Gould said, sort of the result of a whole bunch of little contingent accents, you know. Um, that's something that people actually have a little trouble uh, dealing with. But when you understand the idea that evolution doesn't have a goal, it's not a predictable event, then you have a better feel for why there's such a wide range of diverse things on the planet. And, and these comic books, according to science educators, are, are working at conveying that. In fact, some say that the comic books uh, uh, that students learn more from them than from reading scientific textbooks. That's quite an endorsement. It's a, it's, it's a nice thing to hear. I think, I think one of the strengths of doing a comic book in, in this particular way in which the, the, the information is sort of woven into the story is that by using a story, you provide a context. Um, uh, I could take all of the information out of this book and provide a list that's relatively dry, and that really doesn't give a student anything to hold on to. Um, but there's a lot of research out of um, psychological and educational studies that indicates when you provide students with an image or embed information in a story, um, then students remember it. And the truth is that natural history is one of the most amazing stories out there, and, and why not tell it as that? We literally have just a couple of seconds remaining, but you're a self-taught cartoonist. It's right. Um, I was a cartoonist all throughout college and graduate school and sort of you know, plied my wares in the student newspapers and sort of developed technique that way. Um, I'm at the stage of my career now where I wish I had a few more, uh, you know, mechanical tools. Be, could work with a brush would be nice, but, uh, but um, yeah, I saw myself. your message is getting out there. I, it seems to be, yes. All right, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.